I want to do something a little different today, as I mentioned. My usual lectures involve a lot of details, a thorough review of the latest scientific literature, examples from our clinic, and existing and future applications. If you know me well, you know I rely heavily on data and numbers. It makes sense if you understand my specialty. But as I began preparing today's lecture, I came to the realization that this isn't really a story that needs to be told with a lot of new data uh, or a synopsis of findings from the latest scientific literature, although there will be a little of that. This is a different story, and it begins with truths that all of you, that all of us know, but struggle to employ in our daily lives. I think we make it more and more complicated, and instead of continuing to do that, I want as an experiment today to try to make it simpler. Uh, in the spirit of keeping it simple, I'm going to try and not throw a thousand bullet points on the screen, so like Temple Grandin will sort of think in pictures tonight. Uh, today's lecture is about the concept of emotional well-being, and I hope it can be the beginning of an honest conversation about how we bring this concept to the autism family and learn together how to be and stay truly well. If we do this right, well-being is both an aspirational goal, uh, one we progress towards our entire lives, trying to go farther and farther on that path, but also a daily reality that we practice today, tomorrow, and every day. So let me start with what well-being is and why it matters. The World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. That is, it's not our jobs to merely not be sick, but to thrive. It's not enough to merely not die, but we must also live. The WHO, which is mostly concerned with so-called physical diseases, like acquired injuries, the consequences of malnutrition, heart disease, and so on, astutely included not just physical well-being, but also emotional well-being in their definition. The truth is there's really no difference between the two. The brain and the body are interconnected. That's the whole point of having a brain uh, in order to, for your brain to work with your body. Research, research has shown that measurable brain factors like a disposition towards positivity can actually have effects on cancer outcomes that are comparable in size to choice of chemotherapy agent. Uh, so that's just one example of how big an effect thinking or emotional kinds of functions can have on outcomes. Uh, research, research has also shown that depression is a much bigger risk factor for heart attack than smoking is, it's just to give you an idea of significance. Um, and when people do uh, suffer from both a physical ailment and a psychiatric ailment, the cumulative effects are frequently far harder for them to manage than either condition alone. In fact, most of the disability associated with chronic medical illness is explained by whether or not the person's also depressed, much more so than the severity of the medical problem. Uh, so across many illnesses, another example is depressed people are three times less likely to be able to successfully remain adherent to medications. Uh, so I don't mean to assume too little or too much in terms of how familiar these kinds of statistics are to you, but hopefully they provide an introduction to why and how we feel the way we feel, that emotion, how we feel emotionally is every bit as important as the way we feel physically, if not more so. There's one more reason why it's particularly important for us as the autism family to think about how we feel emotionally. As parents, you need to take care of yourself so you can take care of your children, right? You've all heard this one. So if you're boarding a plane, you see a card like this, and you get told something like, in case of a sudden loss of cabin pressure, inflatable air masks will drop from the ceiling. Uh, if you're like me, you're lucky and you've never actually had this happen to you. But they tell you, uh, in more in particular, if you're traveling with a child, secure your own mask before you help your child and get their mask on. Um, and that actually kind of counters every impulse that parents have, which is why they say this so often. Um, parents, especially parents like you all, you drive, fly, run, leap, fight for your kids, right? There isn't anything you wouldn't do every day. So how would you even think about helping yourself before your child? Uh, but on the airplane, if you try to put your child's mask on first, you can pass out in the process due to lack of breathable air, right? And that's the reason they tell you to do this. So what good would you be to your child at 30,000 feet in an unstable airplane unconscious? And so from that standpoint, on the airplane they tell you, you have to take care of yourself first. And what I want to ask is, where are the places in our lives where if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't be present uh, in the way that we need to be for our children? We can't be parents in the way that we need to be. So the moral of the story is, even if you don't believe 
maintaining your uh, emotional strength or your emotional well-being is important for you. It's important for your families. It's important for your sons and daughters. Uh, and with autism, as you all know, it's a cross-continental flight. It's not a puddle jump. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint, right? So we're in it for the long haul. So taking care of ourselves is important. And uh, sorry. Uh, again, you may know most of these details more or less, but you do know this idea that taking care of yourselves is important. And the problem is not um, conceptually or abstractly believing we have to take care of ourselves. It's actually doing that. It's actually taking care of ourselves. Uh, when I describe our intensive behavioral clinic, I talk about what our therapists do as easy to say and hard to do. Like being told that you lose weight by exercising more and eating less. Everyone knows that already, right? But that's not the same thing as actually losing weight. It's easy to say that you need to take care of yourselves. It's hard to actually do that. And so you need to develop skills that allow you to actually take care of yourselves. So one of the struggles that we have where, where to go from here is the approach we take towards well-being and making it actually work. So I'm a firm believer in tools like mindfulness and other formal tools that help us uh, feel and be better. There's really solid evidence that mindfulness can assist with helping people recover from significant emotional disturbances. It can help them develop a strong, stronger sense of emotional resilience, which is the ability to bounce back from challenges big and small. Uh, and there's a really great evidence basis for all of that. Neuroscientifically, there's even evidence that as that happens, mindfulness can change the brain. But the problem with these tools often is that they're not taught in a way that's broadly applicable to our daily lives. If you've ever gone to a lecture about mindfulness or meditation before, you've probably seen a picture like this one. I think there's a problem with this mentality, and some of you have heard me harp on this before. The problem is that most of us don't struggle to feel mindful or um, meditative or spiritually awakened when we meditate on the beach at sunset. We don't need that kind of help. I think you'd have to have pretty serious problems to not be able to meditate on the beach at sunset by yourself, right? You'd have to be pretty far gone. And most of us aren't that bad off. We're more of the walking wounded. If we keep up building up emotional well-being practices that only work on the beach at sunset, uh, and that only work every few years when the ex family takes an expensive major vacation, is that really going to be enough? I think what we actually need is this. We need well-being practices that work in the chaos of everyday life. Uh, a great example of that is um, John Kabat-Zinn wrote this book called Catastrophe Living. Uh, if you haven't uh, seen this book or heard of it, it's a really good one. It's a really good introduction to this philosophy. Uh, Kabat-Zinn has been translating this concept um, from uh, Eastern history and incorporating modern science and psychological practice for more than 30 years uh, and applying it to all kinds of things ranging from people who couldn't get accurate management of their blood pressure because every time they went to the doctor's office, it shot through the roof, uh, to people who couldn't get on an airplane and that was getting in the way of their jobs, to people who are dealing with major chronic illnesses and things like that, and people who are dealing with developmental challenges as well. Uh, the nice thing about this is, as the title implies, Full Catastrophe Living is all about taking mindfulness and not just making it work on that beach at sunset, but making it work in the midst of the chaos that we experience every day. And if you know me well, you also know that I experience a fair amount of chaos on a regular basis. So I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about mindfulness, if you're, if you're familiar or not familiar with the concept. The first thing I want to stress is actually that you have all experienced mindfulness. Uh, you just may not know that it's called that. Uh, and more particularly, just like the beach at sunset, you may find that you know mindfulness, but you know mindfulness in a very specific concept, context. So people who exercise call the mindfulness the zone. Have you ever heard that term? Uh, like weightlifters. Musicians know it as the groove. Well, maybe that's what they call it, or maybe that's not the way cool people talk anymore, right? I'm not really sure on that point. But the point is that uh, at some point doing something, maybe it is yoga on the beach at sunset. You've been there. You've experienced this state. Um, and there have been different terms throughout the ages to describe the concept. People called it the harmony of the spheres. I kind of like that one. They called it um, feeling God's pleasure. If you've seen the movie Chariots of Fire, that's the way he, uh, the, the man describes why he runs. Um, what mindfulness is truly about is taking that sensation or that state, um, the zone or the groove or um, uh, the harmony of the spheres, making that something you experience anywhere, 
any time, and purely because you want or need to, and not because of the activity involved, right? That's the difference. So lots of people who exercise get in the groove when they're exercising, but the question is, can you take the groove at, or the zone or whatever, and can you pull that out of exercising or a jam session? Can you pull that into everyday life? And can you even have that feeling of the zone at those worst and most chaotic times? So it's important, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it's important that you need to be able to feel mindful whenever you need or want to uh, and I want to kind of introduce some concepts that may help start a conversation about how you do that. Uh, one important concept, sorry, so again, we all know the feeling. Here's another example. Maybe you've done something like this, um, or maybe you find something like this quite disturbing and, and scary. You wouldn't want to do this uh, if your life depended on it. But you've been there. So the observing eye. Uh, there are many different eyes. Uh, for all of you in the room, you're probably many different things. You're probably someone's husband or wife. You're probably someone's son or daughter. Um, outside of me, many of you are um, someone's mother or father. You have a profession, um, or maybe a uh, an identity in retirement. Maybe you have an ethnic identity that you consider important about who you are. And maybe you identify with the kind of music you like or the clothes you wear, um, your religious beliefs, uh, your civic responsibilities. There could be a wide variety of things that define you, right? And that's kind of funny because you say to yourself, well, I am X, right? But the problem is any one thing that you could say to end that sentence doesn't really tell the whole story about who you are. There are actually a lot more layers to it. And you fluidly access these different identities as they're relevant to the task on hand. So you may not approach work as a mother, and you may not approach being a parent uh, in the same way that you approach your partner. Amongst all these eyes, then, there are lots of these different eyes, is a special eye called the observing eye that I want to talk a little bit about. This observing eye is a special eye that emphasizes a concept that I call equipoise. Equipoise means a perfect state of balance. Uh, and my favorite analogy is thinking about big cats like this one. I have a cat, so my little cat you know, kind of thinks he's this big cat sometimes. Um, if you've ever watched cats stalk their prey like on the Nature Channel, uh, you might notice that when they're lurking in the grass, they pass through this moment when they're perfectly still, uh, they're watching an antelope or a gazelle or something that they want. Uh, in that moment, uh, they're dedicated neither to attacking nor walking away. They're actually, they haven't decided to attack, they haven't decided not to attack, they haven't decided to walk away, and they haven't decided not to walk away. When the moment passes, they frequently do one of the two things. But during the moment, they're neither active nor passive, they're neither engaged nor disengaged, they're neither approaching nor avoiding. And that feeling that I presume that the cat has in that moment is what we mean by the observing eye. It's paradoxically the lack of engagement and disengagement that allows this observing eye to make us more able to bravely and fully act on our decisions. To take a step back from our decisions, not to avoid acting, but to be disinterested in whether we act or do not act, allows us to be mindful in our decisions. And when we do that, we find that we make good decisions and we enjoy them. Uh, we find that our ability to make very good decisions is there and we're able to execute on them. Once we have this feeling, uh, we become more like a pond that sits by a tree in the middle of a forest. Uh, on a warm summer day, that pond surface is like a still mirror, right? And a beautiful reflection uh, of nature's glory. From time to time, a leaf falls in the tr from the tree and into the pond, and you can probably imagine that in your head. When it does, uh, in an instant, it shatters the pond's beauty. Uh, the ripples everywhere and the sky is gone and uh, and it seems like a major change but you know ponds right and you know that uh, as a pond um, after that leaf has hit the surface and caused the ripples it'll fall down underneath the surface of the water and it'll sink to the bottom right and when it does that pond will go back to being what it was before and that glassy surface will be back um, the reason that I'm telling you that story is when we become disinterested or disengaged from acting or not acting, both of those things. It allows us to choose whichever one we need to. It also allows us to uh, do things that seem impossible. We can't eliminate fear, but when we embrace the presence of fear without engaging in it, we become transparent to fear, and it can't control us. We cannot eliminate pain, but when we embrace pain without engaging it, again, the pain passes through us and we don't suffer. 
So in that same way, we can do all these things that seem, they seem impossible. We can be buffeted by all these waves. We can be the pond that is rippled by all these leaves, and we can still know who we are and get back to where we were. And when we do that, we're not affected by these negative emotions that master us. So one of the great powers of mindfulness is that by engaging this observing eye, we stop being the victim of our own thoughts. And so I wanna say, stop and think for a moment about your own thoughts. If you're honest with yourself, our thoughts aren't always our friends. Um, and sometimes, when there's a challenge coming up, we blow it off. Uh, we assume we're invincible and unstoppable. We don't study for our exam. Uh, we don't save money, even though we know we have to file taxes and we'll have to owe the government money when the taxes come. Uh, so too little stress or anxiety is bad, because when we don't experience any stress, we don't work hard, and we don't deliver to the level of our talents or the needs of the environment. But isn't there such a thing as too much stress also? For that same exam, we could spend all our time worrying about how hard it is, and how hard it's going to be, and how we're never gonna pass. So much time worrying about our worry, so much time worrying about the exam, that our worries become a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? And then we don't pass the exam. Uh, because all we did was worry instead of study. So too much stress is a problem too. And psychology has a name for that concept. It's called the yerkes dodson Law. Uh, of course, the problem with this information is telling yourself not to be stressed is trying, like trying to think about nothing, if you've ever done that, right? What happens when you think about nothing? It has the opposite effect almost immediately. Something pops into your head. It could be anything, right? It could be salami. It could be uh, what you had for lunch yesterday. It could be where you're supposed to be at 4 o'clock tomorrow, right? Something pops into your head. It could be a song. When you try to think about nothing, it doesn't happen. When you try to tell yourself to not be stressed, frequently we find the same thing that telling yourself not to be stressed just makes you more stressed. So getting back to our thoughts, I said victims, and, and sometimes I mean it, that idea that we are victims to our own thoughts. So that same story of stress applies to our own thoughts. You heard people say that good is the enemy of better. And can't you think of some examples of this where you've lived with some problem or nag that you should have fixed years ago, but since you learned to get by, you just can't seem to get up and do anything about it? Uh, we've all done that, right? Um, we're probably all doing that even right now. So sometimes better is the enemy of good too though. The name for that's perfectionism. I used to think perfectionism was an asset and perhaps in some small amount it is. But perfectionism is probably a good thing far less often than we give it credit for. We all have thoughts that make us feel bad about ourselves instead of doing good and we have thoughts that make us feel good about ourselves and prevent us from doing even more good. So the reality is that our thoughts are often uh, frenemies. That is, they look like friends, and as soon as we drop our guard, wham, they end up doing us wrong. So that's how we become victims of our own thoughts. Where mindfulness comes in is, just like that argument that you can have pain and embrace it without suffering, we can not try to stop these thoughts, because these are pretty natural thoughts, and eliminating them probably wouldn't work any more than doing, thinking of nothing. But instead, you take these thoughts and you allow them to come and go as they please. They're always thoughts we have, and they're never thoughts that have us. We're observant of them, but we're dispassionate towards them. That takes practice, right? We all think terrible thoughts about ourselves. In an extreme version uh, that you may think, but you don't always recognize you think, you may say something like, I'm a failure and I'm always going to be a failure. Like something really awful like that about yourself that you really, most of the time, don't believe. But those thoughts, they come and go. Most of the time, for that kind of ridiculous thought, you can distract yourself. You can knock yourself on the side of the head and say, hey, stop that, right, and it works. But when we're feeling really down, it's hard to be dispassionate towards a thought like that. And also for some thoughts, for most people, there are some of these thoughts that sound ridiculous to you, but they don't sound ridiculous to me when I think them about myself. And there are thoughts that I think that sound completely ridiculous when I think them about myself, but when you think about them, even though they're not true for either of us, they seem very compelling for you. So it's hard to be dispassionate towards some of these thoughts and it takes practice. And practicing this sense of the observer eye, that eye that's stalking in the grass and neither acting nor not acting, is what gets us to that place where we can allow even these sort of deep, dark thoughts to pass through us. So I'd like to take a few minutes to teach you a simple mindfulness technique uh, to make it maximally useful, uh, you would work up to a point where you engage in this 
even, excuse me, even when you're in the midst of some deepest, darkest kind of thought, um, or a full catastrophe kind of moment. Um, you can try that today, but it'll be harder. But you get there by practicing the same technique with relatively easier thoughts, or maybe even when you're not particularly thinking of anything at all. So this technique is one that we've been working on um, actually on my campus uh, for the past couple months. We're still figuring out how to roll it out, but the nice thing about this technique is that mindfulness is totally applicable to all of us, regardless of your degree level or education or background. This technique was also developed so that it's applicable all the way down to the patients and consumers that we serve who have significant cognitive impairments. Maybe not every single one, maybe not um, people who are nonverbal, but even people with significant um, thinking problems uh, or limitations are able to use this technique. So the cool thing is it's kind of something we can all use. The dream at my program, for instance, is for our staff to be able to use it themselves, but also to teach it to our kids. Our kids can teach it to each other, to their parents, and vice versa. And it becomes part of our, um, our corporate uh, toolbox as a group, as a family. So this technique is called Souls of the Feet, and it's actually almost as simple as that, Souls of the Feet. Um, so all it really involves is you're, you're, you're sitting there, you're thinking about stuff, whatever it is. And if you were practicing, maybe you think about something you don't really want to be thinking about. And then as you're doing that, you don't tell yourself to stop thinking, because that's really hard to do, just like thinking about nothing is really hard to do. Instead of telling yourself to stop thinking, instead what you do is you accept those thoughts, they're okay. But what you're going to do is take a moment to just notice the way your feet feel. So notice the soles of your feet. So you can do that right now, right? You can do that anywhere. Notice the way your feet feel. Notice the way that your shoes feel wrapped around your feet, the way the ground feels pressing up. Maybe it feels a little different on the heel and the ball of your foot. Now as you're noticing, you may start to notice your toes and the way that each one of them feels. Um, you may notice if your feet are hot or cold. You're noticing your ankles probably, um, the skin on the tops of your feet. You're noticing all these different things about your feet, right? Not just the soles, but your whole feet maybe even. Um, and if you keep doing that, you probably start noticing what's going on in your calves and your knees and all kinds of other stuff too. But what you do in this technique is, is really that simple. As you're experiencing anything, you train yourself to be able to think about the soles of your feet like that. And as you're doing that, you probably notice all kinds of sensations that you were experiencing before, right? Like before I told you to think about your feet, the ground was already pushing up on the bottom of your feet. Before I was told you to think about your feet, you already had five toes on each one, probably, right? So all these things were going on before you thought about them. The trick is you weren't noticing them, probably, right? Most of the time you don't notice your feet. So when you stop, you start noticing all these rich sensory experiences from your feet. The temperature, um, the way the joints feel, the pressures, um, the, um, the, the skin sensations, right? Um, and all you're doing is observing them. You're not trying to tell yourself that thinking these other things is a problem. You're just trying to observe your feet. And after you've observed your feet for a few moments, you can go right back to whatever it is you're thinking. If you're trying to think about nothing, you can just go on your merry way. If you're trying to think about something, you can let yourself experience that again. But what you're doing is making yourself able to adjust your focus back and forth from whatever it is you're thinking about or doing to your feet, right? So the nice thing about that is your feet are always with you. You can detect them everywhere you go. So you can use this anywhere in any kind of setting. And it's just an example of the way that mindfulness works. It's a very simple technique, but again, mindfulness is not an exercise, but it's the thing you learn experientially from doing these exercises. The intent isn't so much to change you into something that you're not, but to remember what you already were, what you felt when you were in the zone, in the groove, you had the flow or the beat, or you saw the vivid colors, or you ran like the wind, or whatever it is that you can identify with, that you feel, um, that when you do, you feel mindful. So it's just to get you back to that place. And my argument is, as you do this, that ability to switch and notice your feet, even when there's lots of stuff going around, is that same sensation that you get when you're in the zone or in the groove. And all you're doing is teaching yourself to have that without doing the prop that you previously had, which is exercise or um, uh, music or whatever it is. So in that way, I think mindfulness is actually a perfect fit to the topic of developing and maintaining emotional well-being for the family. Because the truth is, I don't want to change you, right? My service is merely here 
to help you to be the best you. So mindfulness is all about that. Mindfulness is a tool to embrace all the reasons you can't take care of yourself, for instance, all the thoughts telling you you'd be selfish to take care of yourself, all the lies you tell yourself about how good we are at taking care of ourselves already and we don't need to do any more. And you're not telling yourself not to think those thoughts, because that doesn't work. But you embrace them and you rob them of these frenemy kind of powers that uh, <coughs> allow them to prevent you from doing what you need to do for yourself, and you simply do what needs to be done in terms of taking care of yourself. So I'd like to do a simple exercise next. Uh, you should all have sheets of paper uh, on your table. Uh, there are some extra pens up here on this front table if you need one. Um, if you're willing, try it. You don't have to. Uh, but what I want you to do is um, take this sheet of paper and um, I want you to brainstorm uh, on things that are the zone or the groove or the mindful times for you. See if you can come up with some. Not times when you have fun necessarily, but times when you felt that right where you were, when you were, you were doing what you should be. That the world was right. So when do you feel that way? Make a column maybe down the left of the side of the sheet of paper or something like that. See if you can come up with a few. Uh, you can think of big things and little things. They don't have to be one or the other. And you don't have to share the items on your list, but if you do, maybe someone will help remember times when they were mindful because of the ones that you have on your list and maybe they've just forgotten. Or maybe they'll come up with times they never even realized that they felt that way. It's a couple minutes to do that. Uh, next to each of them, if I can ask you now to, as another exercise, can you write down roughly when was the last time you did that? Yeah, so what do you see? Was it very recently? Was it ages ago? Do people find that they're doing things mindfully every week? Maybe every day even? If you are, that's, that's off to a really good start. And it's good to see if you can be mindful even more but often, but that's wonderful. But then push yourself to ask, you know, if there's any truly also anything you can experience with that same mindful approach. So the next step is, how can you have that same experience in the way you experience the, the activity in other things besides just that thing that makes you feel mindful? Um, so, so really the, the trick there is pushing yourself to experience mindfulness, but not just in those things that you know will make you mindful. Um, so does anyone find that uh, the last mindful thing on their list was like a year ago? You know, it's maybe some people like two years ago, maybe some people in 1976 or something like that, right? That happens sometimes too. And if that happens, you need to spend time letting yourself experience and getting back in touch with what that groove or mindfulness or zone is for you. Because that may be a good starting place because if it's been a long time, you may not know that experience. And then maybe also some of these exercises like soles of the feet and different imagery exercises can help with that as well. Uh, but the first step is kind of to just get back to that feeling, to at least have it once in a while. Um, next, can you flip the sheet over, please? I'm going to ask you to do something a little different. Uh, and this exercise in particular, and to some extent the last one, uh, are adapted from acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a kind of um, psychotherapy tool that involves mindfulness. Um, so suppose that someone were giving a speech celebrating your life looking back from some point in the distant future. What I don't want you to do is write down what it is that people congratulate you for, like uh, you know, landing on Mars or um, uh, curing cancer or um, uh, uh, figuring out the Facebook privacy settings or whatever it is that you, you achieve. What I want you to do instead is, um, can you write down the adjectives, the words that describe who you would want people to know you are? You can write down things that you do but you don't manage to do every day or be every day. And it's okay to focus on the positives of who you are. But if you try, try not to say, so for this one, try not to say things that are really negative about yourself, but be honest and say, don't say things that aren't who you are I also. I recognize that you don't have to be every positive adjective there is. See if you can come up with maybe five or, or so things. Doing that, what I want you to do next is take a look at that list and draw a line across um, next to each of those things and maybe see if you can, you don't have to write all this down if it's overly complicated, you can write down a word or two to help you remember, but either draw, write or think about where, think about a, some specific instances. Where or when did you see your, that part of you come through? Where was it most likely to shine through? 
So instead of a speech, if, if instead they were turning your life into a movie, these are maybe scenes from your life that you would pick out, that you would want to make sure that were in that movie in order to make sure that those scenes told um, some of your attributes. This is a start towards your values, right? These adjectives that you use to describe yourself are values, and you may find, hopefully, that there's overlap between the scenes that paint your values and the times when you are mindful. Or maybe you didn't think at any of those scenes in remembering the times you were mindful, but in hindsight, that was what was actually happening. What may happen is that you might even find that some of these scenes, if you're pushing really hard, represent the best of you, but came at some of the worst times in your life. Uh, that's what people mean when they say that the human spirit triumphs in adversity, right? So sometimes, in order to really see the best of who we are, you see that in some of these really difficult situations. And what I want to start trying to convince you of is that it's one and the same coin. That thing, that sensation that you're in the zone or where you need to be, that you experience doing these relatively pleasurable things, typically, right, like having coffee or uh, going for a walk, um, these are nice things. And you feel that in the zone kind of sensation. But my argument is that there's something very similar in the zone that you feel when you're living out your values. And that's often happening in very difficult, full catastrophe, chaotic kinds of times. And that similarity between these two situations, again, is what mindfulness is all about. That state of feeling or being where you feel like you're doing what you should be doing, that you're using your skills or talents, that you're using what God has given you um, or uh, what you were born with or what you've built um, over the course of your life. Uh, what all this has to do with emotional well-being is that one of the most central ways to experience and keep emotional well-being is to try and live your life in such a way that you are cultivating experiences where you are mindful. Not experiences that make you happy per se, not just nice things, right? Like we're not talking about spending more time shopping or having a larger budget to buy things or having a fancier television set or having a nicer car, right? We're not talking about, um, often we're not talking about things that money can buy or not very much money anyways. And it's not more particularly, it's not things that make you happy, but things where you're mindful. And the real depth of mindfulness is when you realize that that's that same mindfulness that you experience at the best of times and also often at the worst of times when, you're able, when your values are able to triumph and shine through. So cultivating that experience of knowing that mindfulness when you see it and having it in more, uh, more environments and experiences is what mindfulness is all about. Like asking yourself if I can have this at the best of times and I can have this at the worst of times what is it that stops me from having it all the time with hope? What's the, what is it that stops me from doing just simple things mindfully, if I'm doing very complex things mindfully? Or if I'm doing very complex things, um, if I'm doing um, very simple things mindfully, then can I take that mindfulness and apply it to more complicated things as well? Is there simplicity embedded in that complexity? So, um, not experiences that make you happy necessarily, but experiences that tell you where you should be, doing what you should be doing, uh, tell you you are where you should be. And so you feel in those situations that cat's sense of equipoise. Um, you feel like the tree firm in your identity. You know that as these um, uh, trials and tribulations come through, that they pass through uh, through a firm identity which is driven in those values. And when um, the problems go away, the identity remains, right? When the problems go away, the commitment to taking care of yourself, for instance, remains. So. This is essentially what the homework is. If you're not regularly doing those things that remind, me, remind you of who you are and who you want to be, then emotional well-being is to start with about making time and room for those experiences in your life. So you have to think about it like doctor's orders. You need this as surely as you need oxygen or food or water. Um, if your list of mindful times included something really fancy like a, a trip to China or hang gliding, you may not be able to go out and do those kinds of things tomorrow, right? So what you can do that makes you feel some of that same sense of mindfulness is what you need to be thinking about. Um, ways to be able to achieve some of this without having to do those things that only come once in a great while. And then as you think about the adversities 
in which your values are revealed, does knowing that about yourself allow you to become transparent to adversity so that you can be mindful even in those darkest hours and then ultimately mindful any time that you want to be? Um, lastly, this is the right thing. This maybe can seem kind of a strange slide to bring up, but I want to make a plea for togetherness in the, um, in the autism family. We come from different places. We have different experiences and different needs, right? Um, if you met one person with autism, you met one person with autism. It's a pretty um, common or famous saying in our field. Um, if you met one family with a person with autism, you've met one family. So yet, things like public accountability make a big difference. As a leader, I have to be careful about um, taking care of myself, not only because people depend on me, just like people depend on us all and our families, but also because I set an example. By setting an example of not putting my heart and soul into what we do, then I can kind of count on my people not doing what, I'm putting their hearts and souls into what we do either. And if I don't take care of myself, I can count on my people not taking care of themselves. And if they don't take care of themselves, then they can't take care of the kids we serve, right? Or the families. So being in a place of leadership means people watch what I do. And knowing that people watch what I do makes me be mindful, again, that I'm accountable for my actions. So maybe a lot of you had this experience before. For instance, when you learned you'd be a father or mother for the first time, you suddenly felt like you had to shape up and be an adult. Uh, or maybe um, it was when you got married, or maybe it was at another time in your life when you got your first job. Part of the reason that many ceremonies exist, like weddings and bap baptisms, bar mitzvahs, and so on, is because we make a public commitment to each other, right? When you make, uh, in a church, when you, um, when you confirm someone, the church is making a public commitment to that person that they're going to um, hold them up and, uh, and, um, and help them to seek out God. And then the person is making a public commitment to the church that they will um, seek out God or, or whatever, um, whatever other things are specific to the belief in that specific uh, kind of church. So we make a public commitment to each other. Um, many of you participate in things, like um, you participate in the autism walk that happens every year through Autism Sport of Kent County at Kuiper College, or you wear puzzle pieces or in your button, or buttons or hats, or you wear autism t-shirts. Uh, you have, I have my autism sweatshirt that I wear once in a while. When you make that public commitment, your commitment you're committing to being proud of who you are, uh, of who your family is, of valuing you as a family. And doesn't valuing you mean taking care of you is the right thing to do? There are lots of practical reasons why being one autism family is good. Uh, we're stronger in numbers. We're unstoppable together, even if we're helpless alone. But another thing, as you get to know each other, is that you can and should hold each other accountable, just as you may in your families, your place of worship, your civic life, hold each other accountable. Uh, and that's where this picture comes in. This is a book from about a decade ago. It's actually a really great book um, uh, in sociology and psychology. And what it has to do is, uh, it's about specifically the concept of developing racial identity. Uh, and so this author was dealing with the question uh, of why all the black kids sit together in the cafeteria. And part of what that had to do with was the development of identity as a group. Um, kids pass through different phases. Uh, in the specific context of, of um, race, uh, Kids, uh, uh, kids who are African American pass through different phases of being African American. Kids who are non African American also pass through different phases of being Caucasian or um, Hispanic or uh, Native American or Asian or whatever it is that they are. And they also pass through different phases of understanding each other, right? So little kids uh, are often not aware at all of the concept of race, right? Then later on they start to identify it, but it doesn't mean anything to them. And they may pass through a phase where they um, sort of mindlessly take on views around them. If they're around people who have positive opinions about race and feel that we're all in this together, they may have those kind of opinions themselves. If they're around people with negative opinions, they may have those opinions themselves as well. But what this was about is at a certain age, what you see in, um, in uh, particularly in schools where there's a fair amount of racial diversity, um, kids who are part of a minority group will start sitting together. It's not, because, it's not actually because um, they're trying to shut out other kids, but it's more because it's about them developing a sense of who they are, right? Um, and that sense goes through phases. Uh, and a lot of times with respect to, to racial identity, it can go through phases and lead in different directions. Sometimes 
people ultimately reach a point where, um, as adults, uh, the race is very salient to them. Um, I feel very strongly about being Indian American. I'm involved in a lot of Indian American causes. I look at the things I do through the lens of being Indian American. Or maybe they, um, they and maybe they develop a sense of um, pro-social identity, like, um, like uh, uh, my job out there is to try to create a better world for other people um, of my background, right? Sometimes they may also um, develop another kind of identity, because I said that there are lots of eyes before. Maybe there's a different kind of eye that better defines who they are. And they decide that that is something that's more important to them. Maybe they dynamically balance lots of different things. Um, and in and, and the unfortunate cases, maybe they, they have a hard time accepting who and what they are, and they continue to struggle throughout their lives with that issue. Um, so the reason I bring this up is because I think that that same concept potentially applies to this idea of building an autism family. So I do think that we're stronger in numbers. I do think that we're unstoppable together, and I do think that for better or worse, frequently, any one of us alone is not nearly as powerful. But another thing as you get to know each other is that you can and should hold each other accountable, just as you might in your families, your places of worship, your civic life. So my parting thought is that these are our family rounds, and they're for our individual families, but they're also for the idea of building an autism family in Grand Rapids, just like uh, the autism walk uh, at Kuiper is, and ultimately building an autism family worldwide. So some of you may find that joining that pursuit itself is one of those things that helps you expand your mindful pursuit of a values-driven life. Other people may find that it's just a source of accountability because the people in the room, most of you, aside from uh, Mary and myself, know what it's like to raise someone uh, with special needs, to raise someone with an autism spectrum disorder, right? So you can say something to each other that I may not be able to say to you because I don't really know exactly what it's like because I've met hundreds of kids with autism but I've never had to take one home with me every day because I don't live it on a daily basis, right? So it may not be completely credible when I tell you you have to take care of yourselves. It may be credible in a unique way when you tell each other that you have to take care of yourselves. So that's another thing that the idea of an autism family can potentially do. And I really believe that that autism family ultimately belongs to all of you. And I think that, and I hope that what you do is let it be a tool that empowers you to take care of yourselves so you can continue to build the world you need, uh, the world in which all of our kids thrive and all of our families thrive. So.